Okay, so Pete asked me to keynote. Uh, you know, it's 2015. Uh, I was thinking, what, what can we talk about in the JavaScript community in 2015? Well, obviously, you know, ECMAScript 6 is coming along, which they've kind of rebranded ECMAScript 2015. Not really sure why. Maybe they're going to really release a new version next year. Not totally sure. So I was thinking about what I could talk about, and I thought that maybe uh, ES6 2015 spec line by line. You know, I've done a lot of interesting talks here before. I feel like that this, you know, this would probably probably go down pretty well. So uh, yeah. So first up, so the ECMAScript 2000, you know, ECMAScript JavaScript. What's what's going on there? So ECMAScript spec defines how we implement JavaScript, right? And uh, you know, we come up with a new version. This year's 2015, right? So ECMAScript 2015. Yeah. So you know, it kind of makes sense. Um, oh. Get any ideas, Pete? Turn off that again? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, let's just quit that. Well, I was worried about that, you know, keynote kind of flaky, so I, I, I figured I'd prepare some backup slides, uh, presentations. Uh, this, this, this could work. Yeah. So, <laughs> if you, I mean, if you don't follow me on Twitter, which probably a lot of you don't, I have a dog I talk about a lot. Uh, Probably lacking substance, though. Okay, that's not, that's not gonna happen. Okay, everything you ever want to know about promises, why computers should die in a fire. Uh, Jackie Chan, okay, let's do Jackie Chan. Oh no, I'm giving away the end. I wish I could see this down here. Okay, Jackie Chan. Who doesn't know who Jackie Chan is? Okay, good, we're off to a good start. So you've probably heard of Jackie Chan, right? Uh, but this probably isn't how you've seen Jackie Chan. Like, this is kind of more a Jackie Chan style pose, right? Um, now, I find Jackie Chan kind of funny, uh, but, you know, he's not exactly like, you know, I don't love Jackie Chan. I don't really th thought about him too much. Like, watch some funny kind of action, comedy. Um, so I never really thought about Jackie Chan too much until I came across this. What do you do when your Mac volume thing says I think it's my computer. Please hold. Anybody got any hold music? Pan pipes, nobody got pan pipes with them. Uh, but, oh, there we go. There we go. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. Yay. Hello. Yes. This is Jackie speaking. Hi. My name is Tony, and this is Every Frame of Painting. So, Every Frame of Painting is a really awesome set of video essays on YouTube by, uh, I think he's an editor, Tony Zhu. Um, I don't know anything about filmmaking, and I didn't really even care about filmmaking until I came across these. Um, but his videos are seriously great. They basically take, in this case, they take Jackie Chan and analyze his work. Um, something I didn't know about Jackie Chan is he's a director as well as, you know, a comedic kung fu action guy. Um, and it turns out he's actually a really great director. Um, he talks about this a bunch more in the video, but uh, apparently Jackie's Hong Kong work is a lot more, uh, is just a lot better comedy and action comedy because he's given free reign as a director in Hong Kong, whereas in, in the US, all the Hollywood movies we've seen, uh, he's not the director. So anyway, that great video about Jackie Chan, but this one section really has stuck with me ever since I saw it. Jackie is a perfectionist, willing to do as many takes as necessary to get it right. And in Hong Kong, he's supported by the studio, which gives him months to shoot a fight. And the most difficult thing is when I throw the fan and coming back, more than 120 tick. Those kind of things, oh, Jackie, good. It's not good. You can do it. Except, do you have the patience or not? When I rewatch his work, these little things are the ones I'm most impressed by. He doesn't need to do them and they eat into his budget, but he still does them because he wants to. And it's that going above and beyond that I respect and admire. So, wow, Jackie, good. It's not good. You can do it. Except, do you have the patience or not? Um, whoa, what's going on here? Sorry. 
So that, uh, that nugget, that little quote has really stuck with me, but I kind of have been struggling to figure out why. Like, what, what is it that I actually take, like, want to take from that? Um, so at this point, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule might come to mind. Um, if you haven't been snoozing through the last few years of like pop science, um, this rule has, this supposed rule has come up a lot. So basically Malcolm Gladwell um, looked at a bunch of studies and basically did a bunch of thinking as far as I can tell, um, and decided that if you look across like an array of uh, skills and professions, it takes about 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become like seriously expert in that. Um, so these two ideas, well, sorry, uh, one extra thing on this piece, his point, one is that it takes a lot of time, right? But the second is that it's not that someone is born necessarily like a professional concert pianist, but when you look at professional concert pianists, they've also put in a, a crap load of work, basically. So initially, both of these ideas kind of resonate with me, like quite strongly. So they're both trying to discard the idea that people are like innately and significantly talented like by birth. And in theory, they can say that anyone can be as awesome as Jackie Chan as long as they put in the work, right? But these ideas begin to grate on me the more I think about them too. Like, is perfectionism a good thing? Should we be striving for this like level of amazingness um, in everything we do? Or is it okay to not be that, that great, right? And ultimately, like, I just haven't got time. Like 10,000 hours, if you break it down, that's full time, like 40 hours a week for five years, deliberate practice. Like, first up, I want to learn a lot of stuff. Like, I don't have five years to learn, I don't know, random things, right, to that level of perfection. And the other thing is, like, I know that in things that I've learned, I've got joy out of them without mastering them to that level. So while these ideas, um, I think, are interesting in terms of discarding this, like, innate uh, talent thing, then maybe they kind of get stuck too much on the value of mastery. Um, and ultimately for me, like, you don't have to become a pro to get value out of learning something, right? Um, and as developers in this room, I don't think that's necessarily like a new idea to us. Like, we all learn, right, all the time. Um, but I think we can sometimes become too focused on the things we think we can learn, like technical stuff, um, and discard some of the things we tell ourselves that we could never do. So a few years ago, I would have told myself, there's no way I could be up here like giving this talk because it's terrifying. Um, but, you know, sign up for a talk and give a couple and it, you get better, right? So I want to tell you a little learning story I went through recently. Uh, so another short video clip. Um, carefully note the little clock in the bottom right of the screen. Oh, you can't see it. <laughs> okay, so this is Colin Burns. Um, I never heard of him before until like a month ago. Um, last month, he broke the world speed record for a single solve of Rubik's Cube. That took him 5.25 seconds. Um, so my like zeroth reaction to watching this is like, holy crap, I need to start on my priorities. I've never got that excited about anything, um, <laughs> let alone solving a Rubik's Cube. So, you know, uh, maybe that's the first thing to take. Um, or zero thing. My first reaction is like, okay, how, how do you even solve a Rubik's Cube? Like, I've seen them before. I've picked one up and kind of gone, uh, okay, cool. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, so, yeah, like, ha okay, that's, you know, kind of pointless, but interesting. And like, how close could someone even get, you know, without spending years and years of their life? Second reaction, though, is like, <laughs> yeah, I ain't got time for that. Uh, so, you know, in theory, that's my adult reaction. Um, and yet, here, here I am spending five bucks on Amazon. Uh, pretty cheap, actually, for, uh, you know, for some fun. So a while ago, I got into my head that, you know, maybe, maybe I should figure out how to solve one of these things. And in the process, think about like my experience learning as I do that. Um, so the first time I tried to solve it, I figured, you know, I would uh, self-discipline. I would not look up on the internet how to do it and just see how I could do like figuring out on my own. Uh, 
it turns out they're actually quite complicated. Like, but so it seems like it seems obvious, right? You just have to get all the faces the same color. So you like fiddle around, and eventually you manage to get, you know, one set of faces, like one face to be like all orange or something. And then you realize, well, actually, every every piece has a specific place, right? Because the these centerpieces don't move relative to each other. So orange and white will never move. So you can't put like an orange and green piece here. So it's not just enough to solve one face. Like all those pieces have to be in the right place. And then you're like, well, OK, I've done that. But how the hell, like, how do I solve the rest without breaking the first? And, and yeah. So over time, I went from not being able to do anything at all to solving one face to solving two layers. But ultimately, I could not, like, I couldn't finish it, right? Um, so I kind of gave up. And then on Monday, I was like, keynote. OK, better write, better write a keynote. Uh, I know. <laughs> I'll find the Rubik's Cube. So I decided on Monday that I would look up the instructions and see, uh, you know, see if I could actually learn to solve it, and then see if I could memorize the instructions, and then see how quick I could get. Uh, so this is me on Monday solving it for the second time ever. Uh, I'm still following instructions at this point. Um, this is sped up 6,000%, so 60 times faster. And it's still slower. <laughs> it's still half, half the speed of that world record, even sped up 60 times. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, so by the end of Monday, though, I got down to this. Now, this is only sped up 15 times. So this is after about 40 or 50 solves. Um, I still needed the crib sheet at this point. Um, it's kind of fascinating. They have like no, there's like a notation for Rubik's cubes. So every face has a letter. Uh, so like front, up, down, right, left, back. And then if it's just like F, then it means turn the front clockwise. And if it's F prime, it means turn it counterclockwise. Um, so at first you're like I can't, like you're looking at it and you're like F. And then after a while, you realize, like, wow, my brain has like really got pretty good at at least reading these instructions, right, and, and following them. It doesn't necessarily mean you can like solve it by memory. Um, so yeah. So I'm a long way off the record still. I think I uh, yesterday I got under two minutes without having to cheat, like without reading any instructions. So, but I'm yeah. Th there's no way I'm gonna get close to five five seconds anytime soon. Um, but I have gone from like infinitely slow at solving a Rubik's Cube to only 23 times slower than the world record. So, you know, there's something there. Um, so at this point, you're probably thinking, Phil, that's cool, but it's just a Rubik's Cube. What does this tell us about learning, you know, like really hard stuff, right? Like. Uh, Things which require creativity, things which require, I don't know, like you're using your body for like physical stuff. Um, but over the last kind of year or two, I've learned a lot of stuff. It seems to be an affliction that I decide to learn something, I get mediocrely poor at it, and then just give up. Um, but that kind of going from nothing to not being terrible is kind of fascinating to me. Um, and I think that process for me, it kind of holds no matter what it is. So reflecting on my experience learning, I thought, like, what, what is it that actually stops us learning stuff? Like, what, what is it that gets in our way? Um, so the first is cognitive resources. So um, at FluentConf just a couple of weeks ago, Kathy Sierra, who's a serious pony on Twitter, um, gave an amazing talk. Like, hugely, hugely recommend watching it. Um, called Making Badass Developers. And she talks about uh, these three phases of learning. So basically, in any skill, we go from, like, can't, I can't do this thing, right? I just cannot solve, like, I can't even get one face on this Rubik's Cube. Um, and then you go to, like, with a lot of effort, I can do that skill. But, like, over time, it becomes, like, it's just draining, right? And then you get through to mastery, which is, like, you're reliable, automatic, maybe even subconsciously able to do something. Now, she talks about a couple of things. So one is like this doesn't necessarily hold like this isn't necessarily the full skill. So for a Rubik's cube, it's not like 
you go from, I can't do a Rubik's Cube to, I can solve the whole thing with effort and suddenly I mastered it, but maybe for a subset of tasks. So like solving a face for me now is pretty easy, right? You can just like sit there, doesn't require me any real effort to do it. Um, but the later stages, which are a lot harder and require a lot more moves, I'm still like, okay, front, right, up, right prime, up prime, front, right? Um, so she talks a lot in a lot more detail about these ideas, but um, I think for developers in particular, really interesting because she talks about how, like, if you have too, if you're trying to put too many skills into that middle section, you're just going to get like cognitively drained, and you're not going to make progress on any of them. Um, or perhaps if you've moved a skill into mastery, but you haven't necessarily, you're not doing it very well, so it's like automatic but not good, then you're kind of practicing doing it poorly. Um, so anyway, cognitive resources, I think, ca are worth thinking about when we're thinking about learning. Uh, so on that point, these are my first 15 solves. There's a little app you can use. You just like mash the space bar, and it times how you're doing with the Rubik's Cube. Uh, so you can see like I went from pretty terrible to still pretty bad, but kind of slowly getting better um, until this happened. Uh, this was like 1.15. I normally have lunch at 12. So literally like halfway through the solve, my stomach was like, what are we even doing right now? Um, and yeah, my brain just went to crap. I ended up recording the rest of that um, thing to watch it back and I'm just like, so confused through the whole thing, like really struggling. Even the moves that were normally pretty easy for me, like I was just so cognitively drained that I was really struggling. And doing it with something so like algorithmic and simple and seeing like, okay, if I'm late for lunch, I can't solve a Rubik's Cube. And then thinking about the number of days I'm sitting at my computer like, I just have to fix this bug and then I'll have my lunch and thinking, hmm, maybe I should walk away <laughs> sooner um, if that's how you know, significantly my brain is impacted. Okay. But I think the real killer for learning um, is not even getting started. And I see this over and over again. Like People are just scared to even try. And I think that's because learning, particularly as an adult, is like inher inherently vulnerable, right? It challenges our sense of self to say, I don't know how to do this thing. And sometimes that's like a crazy new skill, and sometimes it's just like a thing that seems like it should be fundamental, like we fundamentally should be able to do. Um, but admitting that and kind of tackling that um, is vulnerable. Um, so we tell ourselves stories about why we're not an arty person or a sporty person or a maths person. You know, something that, oh well, I'm inherently not this, so I don't have to even try. And obviously some things are like very vulnerable, right? Anything physical, like, People are probably watching you, public speaking, like this is a vulnerable place to be. Um, and even if something like drawing or programming, you know, you're gonna show someone else, someone else is gonna see that work, and so you, you know, you're putting yourself, putting yourself out there. Um, so I think the most vulnerable thing I've ever done was learning to dive. So in the run up to the 2012 Olympics, um, I saw some of the high diving on TV and thought, hey, that looks kind of fun. Like, how, how do you even learn to do that? Like, uh, and side note, to be honest, I think the real reason was that as a kid, like, I think we went to like Costa Bravo on a school trip and all the other guys were doing somersaults into the swimming pool and I was way too scared to even try and do a somersault into the swimming pool. So I think like 27 year old me was like, I have to put this 15 year old fear to bed and like actually do a somersault into a swimming pool. Now I know that sounds like you just go up and you jump, but yeah, for me, kind of terrifying. Um, so the whole process was hard though, right? Like even plucking up the courage to sign up for a class when you like don't even know what you're like going in for and you get to the pool and you're surrounded by other people you've never met. Uh, you're in your swimming costume. There are like a bunch of kids around who apparently can like do triple somersaults off the 10 meter board and you're like, what? I just, like what is even, like how, you, what? Like why am I here? <laughs> um, but you know, over time, like, managed to break down some of those fears. Oh, also, I'm terrible with heights. So this was not generally a good plan. Um, and in fact, the now, like, the vulnerability of even still going meant that I don't actually go diving anymore. Like, it just became too cognitively draining every week to go and put myself into that situation. Um, at the same time, I'm super glad I did, right? I got to do the somersault. 
Uh, this, is, uh, this is me diving off the five meter board, which from the ground doesn't look very high. From the top, looks very, very high. And the, the thing with diving is, if you've ever been to like the Commonwealth pool or a pool with a diving, like a diving, uh, separate diving pool, those pools are really, really still. So, and they're like five meters deep. So if you're on the five meter board, you basically can't see where the water is. All you can see is the bottom of the pool, which is actually 10 meters below you. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, so to sum up like learning, like this is I think my favorite quote ever on learning um, and it's from Adventure Time. Um, I think this just sums up, like this sums up kind of my approach or how I like to think my approach is. I think I too often end up trying to perfect something uh, to the uh, neglect of my sanity. Um, but still like this, if you remember anything like this I think is the, uh, is the killer kind of quote. Um, okay, so that was learning. So I want to get meta for a moment. So if we can learn like anything, can we learn to teach? And like, what, what does teaching mean? So if you weren't somehow aware by now, judging by the pictures earlier, uh, last year this guy joined our family. Um, so raising this doofus into a reasonably nice dog has been honestly one of the most heartwarming and enjoyable things I've ever done. Um, Yeah, yeah, he melts my heart, it's crazy. Okay, but before I tell you more about that, I want to do a little experiment. So, is everyone up for a little more class participation? Yeah. Okay, so if you're comfortable, don't worry if you're not. If you're comfortable, can you stand up? Okay. So, I'm just gonna like, just gonna say some commands, just do the commands, don't worry, it's nothing like, nothing weird. So, clap your hands once. Yeah. Wave your hands in the air like you just don't care. Sawate kudasai. Sawate kudasai. Sawate kudasai. Oh. Oh, you don't. This means please sit down. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so this is intuitively like how a lot of people teach dogs. I don't want to like infer that any of your dogs or anything like that, but like this is how people teach the dog commands, right? They just say the thing louder and louder, expecting the dog to somehow understand. And if you've never been taught how to train a dog, <laughs> nope. <laughs> so if you've never been taught how to train a dog, I think this is how a lot of people naturally approach it, right? They look at other people who just like tell their dog sit and the dog sits. So they think, well, to teach a dog to sit, I just have to say sit. Or maybe I like give it a kick, like shove in the butt, and then maybe it'll somehow learn. But like it doesn't work, right? And if you think about it from a dog's perspective, it's pretty obvious, right? Dogs don't understand English. They don't know what you're trying to tell them. And frankly, they don't really care. Like, do you have food? Can I go sleep? I need to go outside to poop. Like that is dog brain, right? So like, sit, sit. Like it just, it just doesn't work fundamentally. And I think basically what this boils down to is like telling is not the same as teaching. So like just telling someone something doesn't mean you're teaching them. So um, to train a dog, what you do is you, to train a dog to sit, you get a piece of food, because most dogs like food. My dog goes crazy for food. Uh, get a piece of food and just like hold it in front of them, right? And they'll be like, oh, food, yeah, I'll, I'll have a go at that. But don't give it to them. And then basically all you have to do is just like move it back and up and they'll be like, whoa. And then, because they kind of get a bit dizzy, they'll like sit their butt on the ground, right? So it's just like a natural action. Like you look up as a dog, you sit. So as soon as they sit, you give them the food. And then you just do that a bunch and they're like, oh, right, I get it. So the food's coming and then they sit. And then once they've nailed that, then you can start to say sit. But you say sit after. You don't say sit like you don't go sit. And they're because they just don't know what it means yet, right? So you say sit as they sit, and then you give them the treat. And then slowly they build up this inference like, oh, okay, there's a sit. He says this thing. This noise happens. I sit down and I get the food, right? And then slowly you can start to like pull the sit before the action. And then over time you'll get to the point where you can say sit and the dog will sit. 
But that requires you to think about like learning from the dog's perspective and not just telling them the thing that you want to tell them, but to actually teach them. So like I believe fundamentally we're all capable of teaching. Like you don't have to think of yourself as a teacher, just like we can all draw, you don't have to think of yourself as an artist, right? Um, and teaching is a hugely valuable gift that you can give somebody, and it's really awesome for your own understanding of stuff. Um, I love teaching anything that I've learned, even if I'm not an expert in it. Like, I don't feel like you have to fundamentally be that 10,000 hours expert to teach something en someone enough to get them excited about something. Um, and from all the teaching I have done, like, this, I think, is fundamentally the, the thing I've learned. is like, think about the way you're conveying that information, don't just tell them it. Okay, so recover from the humiliation of being shouted at in Japanese. Uh, it's your turn to learn before we're done. So my wife and I have been learning a little Japanese recently. Uh, this is katakana. So J Japan uses three, well, maybe maybe more, but at least three um, alphabets. They're not quite alphabets, but. Um, so this is katakana. Um, and it's used for translating like foreign words into Japanese or foreign names. So each of these uh, symbols has a sound. So uh, this is a, e, u, e, o, and then ka, ki, ku, ke, ko, sa, si, su, se, so, right? Easy. <laughs> uh, so this is how you write ski in Japanese. So the first letter is su, and the second is ki, and the, the dash just means like extend the final vowel. So this is like su, ki, ski. Right? And I'm probably doing a poor job of explaining how Japanese works. I'm only still just learning. But basically, this is how it works. You basically take the foreign word for only for translating foreign words. Take the foreign word, and you try and match it kind of as close as you can to these, these uh, symbols and these sounds. So now that I've shown it to you, I'm sure you can find su and ki in this table, right? It's pretty clear where they are, uh, or, or maybe not. So yeah, Japanese is hard. <laughs> um, We've just about got this alphabet and one of the other ones down such that we can pick out the symbols. It doesn't mean we can actually read any Japanese. It just means we can just about read foreign words like ski in Japanese, which isn't necessarily that useful. Um, but fortunately, in the Japanese teaching world, they've realized, like, okay, just showing people this table like, isn't very useful. Uh, how can we use people's brains to help them remember stuff? So turns out brains are really good at like, uh, remembering things if you build a story around them. So, uh, this is a visual mnemonic for su, right? So the symbol, if you kind of squint, looks a little bit like a coat hanger, right? Uh, so like a hanger with which you might hang up your fancy suits. Oh, uh, programming conference. Uh, pretend you have a fancy invisibility suit uh, in, your, in your wardrobe. Yeah, this, this symbol is su, right? So that's su. And then this is the counter for key, uh, which looks like a weird key, and so key, right? Now, these are really useful because they are so much easier for your brain to remember, right? You have, a, you have something like, oh, su, suit, looks like a thing, and then you can find the symbol, right? Now, you don't need to use these forever. Like, eventually, your brain will discard those. Once you go through that cognitively difficult to memorized phase, your brain will discard the need for these, um, but in that learning process, they are super useful. Um, like, if you wanted to, you could totally learn the rest of that table in a couple of hours. Um, my wife and I basically just competed. Uh, there's like a few things online that you, you know, it shows you a thing and you type in the, the sound. Um, and since I stole the pictures from there, Tofugo is great for uh, learning these basic Japanese things. Uh, so then, once you've learned katakana, you can start to translate foreign words into Japanese. You can't actually, don't actually know any Japanese, you can just translate them into the alphabet. So this, uh, this is ja, ba, su, ku, ri, pu, to. Which is about as close as you can get in Japanese katakana to JavaScript. Right? JavaScript. Um, so now you can have a little empathy when you hear someone like a Japanese person trying to say English words and you think, why do they say them so funny? It's just like fundamentally their sounds and their language is so fundamentally different to ours uh, that they have to get as close as they can. Okay. 
So I want to leave you with this final note. Every interaction with someone in our industry is an opportunity to teach or learn or both. Um, and thankfully, you're all here. So uh, have a great conference. Learn some stuff. Teach some stuff. Uh, my name is Philip Roberts. I work for Andyet. We do software development. Um, give us a shout if you need some help. And thank you very much for having me. <laughs>